you raped my sisters, I come to find out. You raped a sister or two along the way. You didn't just molest them. He had a Facebook page. And so from time to time, I'd go check to see if he's going to do what I would say, come up for air, let me know where he's at. Where he's so you going. were doing that intentionally? Yeah, you were looking intentionally. intentionally. I, the only way I could complete this book is if that confrontation took place. Wow. You know what I'm saying? I cannot talk yeah. about being helpless because here we are traumatized for 40 something years. We are helpless. We are at his mercy emotionally. I've got children, I'm married, my sisters have children, they're married, but we are still locked in the clutches because there has not been closure. He has not been confronted. And so I looked for him and I decided to see if he had a Facebook page. Damn, did he have a Facebook page? What so was that would... moment like? What was that was like when you saw it? I was shocked. I could not believe it. This spider whose web extends out to family and friends who knew and did nothing is so brazen and so bold to have a Facebook page and think we will never find it. I typed in his name and there it was. Wow. I knew it was him immediately because he likes to paint. And I saw some of the paintings of like, oh, that's him. That's his artwork. So in December of 2018, I believe, he posted on his Facebook page that his then wife was going to have a going home service. So I saw it. I'm like, OK, what do I do? Because it turns out he lived 15 minutes from me. Oh, my goodness. Oh, God. What? The service was in Van Nuys. I stay in Woodland Hills. He's 15 minutes away. So he mentions this going home service, which for me, growing up in Black neighborhood, Baptist, that just means the small party to talk about her life, which meant the funeral already happened. So my decision had to be, do I go? and handled this. I was not sure what to do. And I called my sister, my second oldest sister, who by the way is the one gave me permission to write this book because I was not gonna write it uh, because it's definitely from a brother's point of view. Let's make that very, this is a brother's story. This is not a sister's story, but I am fortunate in that Two of my brothers, my oldest half brother in Portland, my older brother here and three of my sisters contribute to the book. So you get a family perspective. So if you're a therapist or someone clinical, you're going to get a family's view of what it's like and a brother's view of what, of what happened. So I called her and told her, I know where he's at and I have to go. What was her reaction to that? She said, of course you have to go. Mm -hmm. It was the same reaction where I asked her, can I write this book? I don't want to be disrespectful. And she said, well, you have to write the book. This is a brother's story. This is your story. It's not my story. It's not my sister's story. This is your story. Of course, you need to write the book. All of you boys have a story. Your story is no less important than mine. Granted, I was the one who was molested. But your story is no less important. It is a story that men need to hear because men never talk about it. More importantly, it's a story that sisters like myself, we need to hear what it's like for brothers because we have never heard about it. Certainly not what I was expecting. Yeah. And so when I told her I have found him at this church in Van Nuys, she said, go get him. <laughs> I said, what? Wow. Go get him. I called my oldest sister, go get him. I called uh, one of the twins who I still speak to, go get him. I called my older brother up in Portland, who is an ordained minister. And he said, go get him. I said, what are you guys talking about? This is not what I was <laughs> They're like, you are the one who can bring closure for us. It, no one else could do this but you. 
it has to be you. So that's my older half brother. My older full brother and I, we went to Van Nuys. We let the service continue to its end, to its conclusion. And then I took over the church for 90 minutes. How, how did you handle that? What were you thinking when you were sitting there in church? We watched, my older brother and I, we watched and listened to people talk about the woman who passed away in such glowing terms. So I'm of the opinion that she was a very nice woman. But then we heard people talk about our stepdad, what a great grandfather he is, what a great uncle mm. he is. And my older brother and I are thinking they have absolutely no idea who they have had around their children, their granddaughters, their sisters. So we're sitting back there thinking, okay, did he get to any of those little girls? Has he put any of those little girls on his lap like he did my sisters? Has he hugged those little girls like he did my sisters? you know, getting all excited sexually about it. So we're sitting back there listening to them talk about this man, how wonderful he is knowing what he did to our family. Suffice to say, the 90 minutes was straight out of Hollywood. It is a Hollywood ending unlike any other. And if it had not happened to me, I would have said, no way, this story is made up, it would not go down like this. But I took over that church for 90 minutes in front of a group of over 100 people who had absolutely no idea who I was and I stripped him down. The hardest part for me was to make sure I did nothing physically to him. But as far as I was concerned, when I confronted him, this face, my visage was all I needed to strike fear in him. And then I just took over from there. I brought images of my four youngest sisters and put them in front of him and said, this is what you did to them. This is what you did to her. And the images and just the pictures and just taking over the church. His brother was there. His brother who played a hand in some of our, uh, in some of his work. Um, met his son who was born a year after he supposedly married my mother. <laughs> so he was having uh, uh, relationships with other women while married to my mother and actually had at least one child outside of that marriage. But I got to him and did what I had to do. But the weight of all of that emotional trauma and guilt and shame, so much of it just washed away. It was gone. And I could not wait to get on the phone to tell my sisters that it's over, that we wow. can move forward. See, this is what, Remarkable. what brothers carry. Our sisters don't know just how much we carry. It's not to the degree, not to discount any of my sister's suffering or any woman's suffering. There is no way I would typically, I would say typically there's no way that a man would know. However, my older brother and I, we were molested by our babysitter. So I do know a little bit about it on a, on a daily basis uh, to be taken advantage of. But what we carry without being able to talk to anyone in where sisters can actually, and do, women can actually speak to each other because there are support groups. Men, we've got nothing. Yeah. yeah. We don't even have each other because we don't even talk yeah. about it. And like I said, we can't talk to our sisters. We are so afraid to approach our sisters about it. I was so afraid to talk to my sisters about it. What did you think was gonna happen? <sighs> I think I cut you off there at the end there. No, 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 it's... What did I think was going to happen? Uh, pretty much what happened to me in 1977 when my older sister spun around and pointed her finger at us and said, you can't talk to anyone about this. It didn't happen to you boys. To go through that again 
No. I didn't want to experience that again, especially after years of not talking to them. Some of them I didn't speak to for years after that. And now that we had gotten back to speaking again, I didn't want to see that fall apart. And I certainly didn't want to hear those words, no, you can't talk to me because it didn't happen to you. It's scary. So what happened after the 90 minutes? After the 90 minutes. When you were in the church. Yeah. It is a spectacular, it is a spectacular 90 minutes. Uh, my older brother and I, uh, we finally made our way out of the church, stunned. All of a sudden, people started converging on my ex stepfather. And here, here's a, a situation, by the way. People would ask, well, why would you go to the church? Well, he posted the notice on Facebook about his ex wife. <laughs> So he posted it in a public oh, forum. And as far as I'm concerned, you invited the world. You know, this wasn't a private post. You posted it on Facebook. You told people where you were going to be. You came up for air. And as far as I was concerned, you invited me to the party. And I went to the party. And it became a day of reckoning party more than anything else. So my brother and I, we left as people converged on him. And as we were leaving, we were just so uh, euphoric about what happened, what we did, what we accomplished. But we also talked about, do you think he got to any of the women in that church, any of the young women? Do you think he got to them? And we said, mm -hmm. well, he, he has to. That's his nature. Yeah, he did. So we got in the car, started to drive away. And as we were driving down the street, I was driving, the driver's side window was down, and all I heard off in the distance was this loud, hey! And we're just starting to slowing down. And I look at my older brother and said, you hear something? He said, I, I think so. So we start driving some more, and hey! Come screaming out of the air again. It was a bright, sunny day. It is just came. I stopped the car, and I looked. And this young woman must be in her early 20s, comes running across the grass, comes running through the street. And she said, I got to got to talk to you. And I looked at my older brother and said, I think you got to her? He said, I think so. So she comes wow. to the car and she says, the woman who passed away was my grandmother. I need to speak to you about what happened. I need to talk to you about something. And I said, OK. What I noticed as she was running across the street when she got to the car, I had the eight by 10 pictures of all eight of us kids that I put in my stepdad, ex-stepfather's face. She had them clutched to her chest. She had picked them up because I had dropped them on the floor as we were leaving. She picked them up and ran across the grass and up to the car with them clutched to her. I looked at my older brother and I said, she's got the pictures. He said, dude, I see she's got the pictures. She picked them up. So I gave her my phone number. She said, call me anytime if you have a question. She said, okay, I will. Because I have to talk to you about this. So we are convinced that he did get to her or he got to someone that she knows in the family, a niece, a cousin, someone. No, I have not heard from her. But one of the more interesting aspects of it. The pastor in the church, after seeing and hearing what me and my brother, primarily me, because my older brother only said two things during the 90 minutes, he didn't say a word to us. He offered us no words of comfort. There was also another female pastor from Chatsworth. Now, this female pastor from Chatsworth, she talked about how the woman who passed away and our ex-stepdad uh, were an intimate part of their church. She said nothing to us. So I waited for about two weeks and then I reached out to her and said, this is who I am. I saw what you did and what you said at the church. Can you check on the, those girls at that church? Because now you know you have a serial rapist in that family. Do you know she balked? She refused to do it. Wow. Therein lies the problem. The systemic mm -hmm. nature of the protections put in place for molesters and rapists runs across all spectrums of our community. 
law enforcement, uh, religious, these things that are put in place because people, I don't want to get involved in that family, or I'm afraid I might do something that might get me in trouble. And every time you pass, every time you don't do anything, you condemn those children. We were condemned again when that pastor, a female pastor, a woman who should know better, chose not to help those girls and make sure they are protected. You condemn them. Which just makes things, again, worse. It makes things worse. It gives the molester, it gives the sexual predator permission right. to move forward. And as I like to say, he's the spider, and everyone that he touches is part of this ever-expanding web. And now the female pastor, she's part of the web. In essence, she's part of his protection. She's complicit. My grandmothers knew because I talked to them about it, and they told me, yes, I knew. Did nothing. Other relatives did nothing. Friends knew, did nothing. And they all became part of this protective detail to protect this predator for whatever reason they chose. It was whatever reason they chose was selfish. But they continued to condemn my sisters to a life of being molested and their nephews to a life of suffering. You have to speak up no matter how hard it is. And sisters need to speak to their brothers. They may be the only men who will listen to you and believe you. And not all brothers do. I can tell you this from firsthand knowledge, not all brothers do. When, when your stepdad saw you in the church, what was that like? Did, did he, rec he, he recognize you? James, what was, how, tell me, on what was on that, that night in 1986, when I confronted him, like I said, he's six six, like two hundred forty pounds. I like five eight, and so our height difference. When I went up to him, my nose was at his chest. That was the height difference, almost a foot taller than me. And so I'm looking up the side of a mountain, and I'm telling him, "You are going to be dead tomorrow because I'm going to kill you if you don't leave." Well, when my older brother and I got to the church. His health was such that he had to use a walker. And I told anyone who would listen, I don't care what his health condition is. He could be on a gurney taking his last 10 breaths. He is going to hear from me because you do not get to ride off into the sunset. No way in hell is that going to happen. You are going to get yours. You, I could say he could be on his deathbed. I did not care. I don't want to hear about forgive me because no, we have been suffering for 40 years and you want me to forgive you. Well, I didn't do anything wrong. You, on the other hand, have not apologized and not made restitution. Same goes to my mother at this point, quite frankly. So leading up to when I actually got in front of him, after the service, there was a line of six people. And you know how they do the line up to say your goodwill and all that, happy, everything's going okay, blah, blah, blah. Right. But when I got to him, he was sitting down. I stepped in front of him and he looked up. So now... Everything is flipped. Mm -hmm. 33 years ago, it's me down here looking up at him. Well, today, on that day, it was him down here, and he had to look up at me. And when I looked down and I called him by his name and just looked, he started, hey, he got ready to call me by my name, and then he stopped. All the blood drained from his face. And I leaned down and said, your, I called it by his name, your day of reckoning has arrived. There is no place for you to go. And I used all the colorful language I could muster. It was spectacular. Mm -hmm. And said, you do not get to ride off into the sunset. Not about to happen. He could not move. He was looking up the side of a mountain. So the roles were reversed. And then I took over from there for 90 minutes. It was interesting. We, toward the end of what I did, there was a woman who was in line ahead of my older brother and I. And after I had shown my stepdad all 10 pictures, boom, 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 boom. This is who this is. You did this to her. You did this to him. Blah, 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 blah. You left us like this. Blah, 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 blah. And started to walk away. This woman in black 
rushed over and picked up the pictures. And I'm hearing her tell another gentleman, put these pictures away, don't let anyone see this. So now she has chosen to be complicit in the crime. She's a willing participant in the cover-up. As we continue throughout this 90 minutes, we are getting ready to leave. And my older brother and I hear this voice off to the side, gentlemen, 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 now is not the time and the place for this. And my older mm -hmm. brother looks at this woman and says, there is never a right time and a place for this conversation. And she says, but now's not the good time. I'm a therapist. I'm a therapist. The woman who said that, I'm a therapist is the woman who picked up the pictures and told her friend to hide them. Now imagine that mm -hmm. for a second. You are a therapist. Your job is to help people. You know these two gentlemen are in pain. You have just heard their sisters were molested and raped for 17 years. And you know the person who did it is your friend who you knew nothing about. You knew nothing about his past deeds until we stepped in there. And you chose to protect him who may have molested and raped other little girls in that church. You chose to protect him. And then at the end, you're going to tell us you're a therapist and this is not the right time and place. What you did earlier was not only not the right time and place, but you brought in another person who you asked to help hide the pictures. And so now he's part of the web. She's part of the web. <laughs> we told this woman, oh, no, 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 no. My older brother, his one of the two, two things he said was now is not the, she said they, he said, there is no right time and place. And that's when members of the church started shaking their head. He's right. Because for me, if I didn't do it that day, he might not ever come up for air again. I might not ever see him again. Right. All of this is in this book. And so the reason why it's called helplessness, because it was 45 years of being helpless emotionally around all this stuff, losing relationships with my brothers and sisters, um, just watching it fall apart. And then the next book, Hopefulness, is about what were the steps those people who came into my life who helped me find hope, friends, family, events, uh, friends like you, uh, you know, these, these people that can start to help you give a different meaning to your life, you know, give you a different uh, emotional um, um, outlook. And so these people are important. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, People like you are uh, not only important, but you are essential to not only the grieving process, but more importantly, uh, you're essential to the healing process. And well, we victims need to recognize there are those people who help us uh, find a way out, who keep us tethered emotionally. Because there are moments when you can spiral so out of control. And I had a day where, uh, in writing this book, where I uh, started going down the rabbit hole. I, it was a very, very, very difficult day when I realized something happened after 40 years of seeing it. And uh, I started to lose it emotionally. I was, I was going down fast. Um, so, so that's what the uh, helplessness book is, hopefulness, and then book three will be about happiness, those people who make me happy, who makes my life happy now, and understand I am typically not a turn-the-cheek person, if you've done something I will give you room to fix it. But if you've done something and you haven't made any attempt to fix it, that sooner or later, we will have to talk about the issue. <laughs> but I choose to use our trauma, our devastation, our pain, our suffering for good, as opposed to letting it keep me in the dark. 
I choose to use our story as a lesson for other families to pay attention, to be vigilant, to be aware, to listen, to observe, to give the room to believe your sister, your daughters, when they say something has happened to them by someone in the family, to not overlook that if you're an aunt or an uncle or a grandparent, like, like those things that happened to us. You must pay attention. And here we are on the cusp of musical greatness. And I'm thinking our gift to the world is going to be music, but it turns out it's going to be this story. Something bigger. Yeah, it's going to be hopefully something that men will read and say, you know, I know exactly how this guy is feeling. His story is my story. Because men, we need to talk about this. There needs to be some policy discussion about this. How do we protect children from molesters and rapists in our own home or in our community? Uh, I, I want to have a much broader um, policy discussion about this. And that's part of what this is about, using our story to do that. Wonderful. Really something.